factor in continuing to do elevations after build it back um, or figuring out another funding source, but certainly figuring out how to establish an ongoing program for both the alternative mitigation and the, you know, the amount of information we learn on a regular basis about um, what it means to elevate and what the issues are with alternative mitigation. All of that, I think, is something you know, we should talk about how to continue to structure programs um, that can move forward in partnership with the you know, design and construction community and in partnership with the local nonprofits like Center for New York City Neighborhoods and all of the groups that work on this. And I'm assuming in this conversation, we, we can go forever on possibility. Uh, tell us a little bit about where the CDBG uh, funds and where, where essentially that might end and where the commitment from the city uh, if you have numbers about where we have, wh wh uh, when is the well going to dry up, is, uh, and and really try to understand when we start embarking on that, those concepts of, of where we have partnerships. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think we should discuss those, have those conversations now, right? Um, in terms of what lessons learned from both the, you know, kind of who to elevate, who to acquire, who to who to rebuild, who you can't, you know, who it's very difficult to rebuild what to do with all of these attached homes and homes that are uh, uh, attached to each other and how to prepare either for homeowners to continue to do this on their own and communities to do this and potentially other funding sources and certainly be ready, um, God forbid, in, in if another disaster hits the city. And on back to the concept of community discussions, do you, do, does your team have uh, you have an ensemble and team that goes into communities and has these discussions less of an applicant conversation and more of a let's have a community discussion about what's happening and yeah. and really again back to how do, how do we really not just um, uh, not just to focus on that applicant and all the work that's happening there but really thinking about it block by block neighborhood by neighborhood yeah. I'm thinking about places like Red Hook for example yeah. that so. so I would say one of the first steps of that is what city planning is doing. So they're having their resiliency um, workshops, nights. I don't, don't know the exact. Um, they have the first one in, in Staten Island tomorrow, I believe. Um, and we'll be part of that. And the Office of Recovery and Resiliency will be part of that. And it's, it's an effort to really talk to the community about resiliency on a, on a more broader scale. So I think that's the first step in that process. And, and moving forward out of that, we'd love to talk about ways to continue that conversation. Because I think that's where we're going to really understand how, how we as, as council members can bring our communities forward and really bring that muscle and say, look, this is where we need to move, especially when we get to the point where we might need more capital, uh, the injection of ca capital dollars that don't exist now for some ideas that actually might be um, positive and productive that are come from the community, not from the specialists that are in the ground right now, right. but from community. Uh, where, and I'm thinking about Red Hook right now where we're getting so many different projects that are not always connected and we're yeah. trying to connect them from NYCHA, the half a billion dollars that's on its way and we just broke ground there on the roofs in NYCHA. Uh, Coney Island is going through that as well. All, all our communities are yeah. going through that and how, how we start connecting the dots and allowing build, build it back to, to actually leave, leave competency in our neighborhoods with homeowners that might want to just do something different um, and beyond their current case, which are, are and have been incredible headaches, um, but your team has in some ways brought miracles to so many different people, and we want to acknowledge that, but we want to make sure that we learn from this, that when we come back, uh, and, and we're not done with hurricane season, and this has been an incredibly active hurricane, and, and the trauma that we are experiencing, you're hearing it right now mm -hmm. from us, but it's, it's real, and I know that you know this, you're on the ground uh, every day. So I, that's it for me right now, and I look forward to working with you on those community discussions. We do too. Thank you. Thank very you. Much. Okay. Next, we have Councilmember Donovan Richards. Thank you, uh, Chair, and thank you for this hearing. And, and I just want to echo what uh, Councilmember Menchaca certainly said. I hope you can appreciate and understand our anxieties and frustrations because you know the more of these storms that pop up, the more we relive this stuff. You know, for those of us who were there during the storm and the days after, you know, to see what's going on around the world, uh, from Mexico to Puerto Rico to what's happening in the States, you know, our constituents are on edge. And for those who are not back in their homes yet, they're even on further edge because they're not back in their homes. So I hope you can really appreciate where we're coming from 
uh, to date. With that being said, I wanted to know where are we at with acquisitions in the Rockaways and where are we at with rebuilds? You know, I know we have starts, but when do we anticipate many of these starts will finish? And I think just I don't have many more questions because I feel like we're just going in a circle um, every time we have these hearings. Um, but I think the main question for all of us is that we just don't want to be sitting here next year having the same conversation. And I, I'm hoping, you know, although we have not set, you know, firm deadlines this year, that by this time next year, God willing, we're having a celebratory conversation on how much Amy Peterson got accomplished uh, between now and next, uh, as we celebrate the, the anniversary, well, uh, memorialize the anniversary of Sandy as it's coming up, but also next year. So do we anticipate next year will be finished? How sooner we will, will we be there? We will definitely not be having this conversation a year Are you now. positive? I am 100%. I mean. So you're going to put this committee out of business? Well, this committee is about a lot of things related to resiliency, but we are, you know, we've really turned the corner on Build It Back, and we've really made tremendous progress, and you can walk around any of these neighborhoods and see it. Um, yes, Queens is definitely... Um, and Staten Island is first. I'm a little upset with uh, yes. Matty O'Leaves. I want Queens <laughs> to be first, but... Well, well, Queens has has the largest population, and we've done some mm -hmm. really exciting things. You know, Edgemere is a model for mm -hmm. where you take a part of the neighborhood and... Um, you know, move people out of that part mm -hmm. of the neighborhood mm -hmm. where you elevate a lot of attached homes and bring a lot of neighbors in and, and do a lot of exciting things. So um, we are working really hard to get as many homes done um, over the next couple months, and, and only some of the more complex ones will go into early next year. So how many so. more do we have left? In Queens. So we have starts. Yes. So in Queens, we are 86% city-managed complete. And, um, city managed means city we're managed completed. Means, full product means not is finished. the ones where the homeowners are managing themselves. Okay, got it right. Um, got so, and mm -hmm. I'll give you the exact number for how many are remaining in all of your neighborhoods okay. after the meeting. Okay. And on acquisitions, how are we doing on moving people, acquiring and moving? So, so good. You know, we've made. Um, it, it is a complicated process to buy someone's home, and there's a lot of pieces mm -hmm. you have to go through, and, and often the homeowners are kind of figuring out some stuff. Um, but we reached out to everyone um, and um, have made all the offers, and it's, it's really up to some extent to the homeowner's timeline in terms of moving forward with some of the pieces. But we can give you the information on that also and kind of what the plans are for each of the communities in your neighborhoods where we are acquiring homes. And on a Sandy tracker, is it a way to make sure that this information as the, uh, I actually um, had, that was my first piece of yeah. legislation that actually passed. And on, and on it, is there a way to disseminate the information this way, the exact way? Yeah, to so explain the it a little bit Because it's very broad online. Yeah, yeah. And so is there a way to disseminate and break down the information a yeah, little bit? Yeah, so, so let's sit down Better for the public, to, one, we want to do it. I think, enough. you know, right. we have... Mm -hmm. We have by neighborhood and zip code mm -hmm. and, and, you know, official um, mm -hmm. council district, et cetera, um, the, the key stats. We don't have something like acquisition just because right. it's not one right. of our um, ones that are in all of our mm -hmm. reports. So um, why don't we talk about other things that you'd like to put up right. there? Because we, we feel strongly about wanting to put stuff up there and, and making as much data as available right. as possible. All righty. Thank you. I, so I'll wait that information. And thank you, Mr. <laughs> Chairman, for continuing to hold the city's feet to the fire. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Now, I'll have some more commentary afterwards, but I want to be respectful of my colleagues. Uh, Councilmember Perkins. Yeah. The, uh, a quick question about those who, who were dropped out um, because of the uh, transfer amount that they would have to uh, bring, uh, provide. Um, so what, what is the status of those applicants? So do we have any sort of understanding of what they've been doing? Are they, are they no longer in need? Or? Yeah, so the, the transfer amount and, um, is when someone gets more benefits from another source, mm -hmm. and then if we're going to rebuild their home, we take that, those funds. And because of people's needs, they often spend that money on other things that aren't necessarily what it was originally meant for and can't provide it to us. So one... We worked with NIDIS and um, all of the disaster case managers to try to help the, the most in need to get other funding to deal with, um, not to necessarily pay their transfer amounts, but to pay their mortgage for a couple months or something so they could pay their transfer amount. 
Um, but the transfer mounts a, a, a problem and a, a question that needs to be addressed. Um, often, maybe the homeowners, you know, have the funds to do what they need to do, but sometimes they just, you know, can't come up with those funds. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and just to circle back, I mean, I, I just want to kind of put into context uh, some, some of the frustrations I have here today is that I, I am not talking about, obviously, we could spend a lot of time discussing how the, the Bloomberg administration really dropped the ball big time. And I'm still trying to figure out whether it was incompetence or being told wrong information from the federal government, but that's for a separate hearing. Uh, my frustration is that those folks who have made it through the pipeline have gone through the process. And quite frankly, I do credit you for helping them move through the process because in the beginning there was no movement whatsoever, Director Peterson, so that's a credit to you and your team for that. But my frustration is that within the past year or so, now they're being told upon second look, we can't do a rebuild or elevation. Um, and that is important to them because they have many, uh, first of all, they've sustained significant damage. Some of them, as you know, have used their savings to, to cover the cost of damage. They have kids in college. They're suffering from illness. Um, and they're, they're reliant on this. They're also concerned about uh, flood insurance costs that, that, that are looming. And if, you're, if you have an elevated house, that could mitigate and offset some of those flood insurance costs. That's the frustration. Uh, and I've been contacted by a number of these families. We've heard from them even in the, when we had an event in Staten Island. Some of them spoke uh, at, at the town hall there saying that, you know, I followed all the instructions, I followed, followed everything that they asked me to do, and now at the, at the 11th hour, I, I'm told I'm no longer eligible for a, a full rebuild elevation. That's what's frustrating. And what I'm also trying to understand is, you know, what happened? What changed? Did this HUD, these HUD directives, these HUD uh, guidance or, 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 or regulations, what has changed that, you know, and, and that is very, very frustrating for us because it's hard to, you know, I, I certainly echo the comments of my colleague, Councilman Chaka, about wanting to discuss lessons learned, move forward for the future. And, and I, don't, I just want to disagree with the characterization that we're going in circles. We have to help these people. We have to help them. We were given, the bottom line is we were given a lot of money to help a lot of people. And that's not our money, it's their money. We have to help them. And it's frustrating when they come to our offices now five years after the storm. And again, we, we personalize this because it's our job as elected officials to do all we can to help them. And to say, I don't know what has happened. I don't know what has changed. No one's explained to me what has changed. Why am I no longer eligible for a full rebuild or elevation? That really is, it's, it's very disappointing. And then we see that it's, it's not just in one part of the city, it's popping up cases in other parts of the city. I'm not sure, Councilman Chaka, if, if you've had cases like that in your district, but we're getting these cases and I'm trying to figure out what's happening, what has changed. And if they don't respond to their new options of flipping down for a moderate, a moderate uh, rehabilitation or minor rehabilitation, if they don't respond by a certain amount of time, they will be deemed unresponsive and they will be withdrawn from the program. And I think that is what, or, or if, if they're trying to figure out how, how to appeal the decision, some of them might have to be forced to hire attorneys, which with money they don't have, that, so am I, am I being clear, Director Peterson? That is my frustration. What, these particular cases of those folks, uh, to credit of your office, help them move along. They've selected their option. They've gone in, their life is now in storage boxes. Work has not begun on their properties for whatever reason. But now they're told, sorry, upon reinspection, you we can't do this for you anymore. Is that clear? So I would say um, I have been lucky enough in this position to work with an incredible group of people. Um, and the team that I work with from the homeowner services team to the borough operations team, all of these people who you know who's, who've been in this community, to our technical services team, 
know each of these homeowners personally and have walked through with each of these homeowners their specific situation. We don't take any of these decisions lightly, but we are also responsible for um, ensuring that they are eligible for the funds that they're getting um, and that we're giving them the best thing to help prepare them for resiliency. Sometimes those are tough decisions um, and sometimes those are dependent on their neighbor's participation and sometimes it's not exactly what they want and I, I, I know that they come to you and to everyone else. Um, they come to me and I talk to all of them. Um, we want to help everyone um, and figure out the way to get them to the pathway that they're both eligible for um, that best makes their home resilient and helps them um, finish the program. And the team of people that I have works with them. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we have Center for New York City Neighborhoods, so they have legal counseling that they can go to. And there's a lot of processes that they work through and we work through with them. And as we get closer to the end of the program, um, it's clear that there's people, there's a few people who continue to be frustrated, but there's also, you know, 80, 8,000 people who have, you know, completed the program um, and are, are, are completing the program and are being served and moving forward. So I, I heard in your testimony about uh, there were about uh, 58 flip downs, so to speak, mm -hmm. um, but 50 were above base flood elevation. Correct. So can you explain the eight discrepancy? I, I, I can get the information for the eight. I don't have it with me. Okay. Um, it, it would be helpful. And, and I also noted that in your testimony about uh, the Center for Mixed Neighborhoods and, and the uh, study that's supposed to be released with CUNY, that they've taken on about 4,000 cases. Is that correct? Center for New York City Neighborhoods worked with 4,000 of the applicants Four. and for 6,000 cases, meaning they might have helped them with a transfer amount and then they also helped them with some sort of legal counseling. So I'm just questioning what about the other folks? That they, because it's obviously there were more, more than 4,000. It was offered to everyone. Because so people took advantage of it or didn't. I, I, will, I will just say that uh, those folks that I have spoken with were not aware of this. Uh, okay, so we should... You know, it, it's one of the things that's great about working with the city council is actually sitting down and, and talking about the specific people. Um, and if there's people who don't think they have access to Center for New York City Neighborhoods for whatever reason, we'll certainly connect them directly. So, right. You see, and and you obviously can do that too. Right. It's it's just that to be very blunt, uh, organizations that sometimes that deal with cases, when the city contracts with them. <coughs> There's a clause in the contract that non-disclosure agreements. So they're limited in what they could share publicly and what they could share in these types of forums and discussions. But when you speak to Sandy survivors and build it back applicants, you know, off the record and just, you know, meetings, they're, they're afraid of any type of retribution. They're, they're fearful of these things. But what I'm noting is a pattern that it's not just one person saying that my house was reevaluated. It, noticing it's more, it's more than just one. If it was just one isolated case, I could, we could figure out what happened there, but it's more than one. And it's not just in my district. As a matter of fact, I, I'm taking heat for folks from Staten Island, from Queens, and from other parts of the city. So it's, I, I'm actually, I'm feeling for them. Um, and they come, they come to my office, and I, I can't ignore them. I can't ignore them. Um, so I do want fi to figure, figure this out. Um, and if you have any of uh, when is, let me ask this question, Director Peterson. Uh, other than the city's action plan amendment, what other communication takes place between the city and HUD to ensure that Build It Back is serving homeowners uh, properly? Is there anyone at HUD that oversees the city and its Build It Back work on an on ongoing basis? And can you describe the last communication that you had with them? Yes, we are in regular contact with HUD. We have regular technical assistance calls. They do regular monitoring visits. They come up and meet with senior leadership. I saw people from both the regional office and the Washington office from HUD last week. We're in constant contact with them in addition to the IG who audits us. So you they're very supportive in their work with us. But can you describe the, the, the nature of, of recent discussions or discussions within the past year from HUD? What, 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 can you share what they've been asking of the city and if you can just give us any, any light on that? Yeah, so we meet with them regularly to talk about um, 
both the budget, um, how we're doing in terms of our cost reasonableness, where we are in terms of completing the program, many of the things that you talk about. We work with them on technical assistance. So for example, the when we made when this administration made the decision to provide rental assistance to homeowners when they were out of their home for build it back, um, in a visit with them, they looked specifically at they discussed the option of doing some temporary housing services contracts. So the NIDIS contract with, with us in Center for New York City Neighborhood and NIDIS where we do a master lease for homeowners, that was a result of their technical assistance. They've toured a number of the neighborhoods. They've been to Coney Island and Sheepshead Bay and, and all of the neighborhoods. So they're very actively involved with us and talk to us about all the issues from kind of HUD compliance files and things like that to um, better ways to serve the public. And, and we're gonna, I think, be talking to them and FEMA and everyone about disaster recovery moving forward as, as their role has greatly expanded across the country. Okay, so, but can you just let us know, did, did HUD ask you whether in a, in a meeting or in a letter to you or to your office, did they ask you to inspect uh, to, or reinspect all applications, or this was a decision that you made at your level? It's a, it's a little bit of both, right? So as we've mentioned, we'll share the directive when they approve the action plan to ensure that we were moving through the best process um, and providing the right benefits to the people and cost reasonableness and all of this. So at that point in time, also understanding that we knew a lot more about elevation, we made the determination to go through the pathway verification review. Because I, I just want to, just share with my colleagues uh, that we uh, in, to discuss lessons learned for the future. We need to know where does the line, uh, where is the line drawn between what's required of us and what's discretionary. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, what's what's a regulation that we have to follow, or what's a decision that we can make on the ground. Mm -hmm. We need to know that moving forward, because decisions were made even before your arrival that were told to us that they these were requirements, and now I'm being told those were not requirements; those were discretionary decisions. And it's, it's frustrating, not just for me, as a, I'm just a chair of a committee, but people who are really in the situation, it's very, very frustrating. Uh, now, at a recent uh, town hall in Sheepshead Bay, the mayor did announce that there would be this new deadline for the program, and obviously he mentioned that they're gonna discuss a new goal or, or in place in the near future, which has created chatter in the local community. Yeah. And so I'm Sorry. compelled to ask, what was the mayor referring to, Director Peterson? Um, at the Sheepshead Bay um, Town Hall, the mayor committed to the residents of the Sheepshead Bay Courts that we were moving forward with the infrastructure funding um, and discuss the schedule for that. Um, and that is what was announced in the action plan that was the draft action plan that was released last week um, that we're committing $20 million to the Sheepshead Bay infrastructure. That was the, ref that's what he referred to. Okay, so there's no new goal or deadline that they're, they're putting in. Yeah, and I, I I definitely support the work you're doing in Sheepshead Bay. It's not my district, but I think it's, it's necessary and it's, it's important. Uh, can you share with us how much uh, CDBG DR funding remains? I will turn to the OMB team to answer that question. Oh, our, our favorite. Just, uh, just get you sworn in. Um, if you could just uh, uh, please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Thank you. Can you just please introduce yourself? My name is John Grath Hall. I'm a deputy director at the New York City Office of Management and Budget. So the question was, how yeah. much remains? CDBGDR CDBG funding, yes. Um, I think that, as you know, there is a total grant of $4.2 billion mm -hmm. in the main portion of it. And there's several ways of slicing it. Like, for example, <coughs> you can say, how much have we been reimbursed by the federal government, right? And then you could say, if it were that simple, all the rest remains, except we have such a pipeline of spending going on that you have to look at what's the estimated, you know, we have to say really what's committed. So for example, 
we have at this time been reimbursed $2 billion. So we've been reimbursed 47% of the grant. All of the funding is allocated to programs. However, and a considerable amount of that additional funding has been spent. And the stuff that has not yet been spent, you know, for example, a contractor does the work on a build it back home. They haven't submit the submitted the invoice to us. Once we get the invoice and cut them a check, it's spent. So I guess the simplest way to look at this is all the money has been allocated and that we've been reimbursed $2 billion. And some of these programs, the coastal resiliency programs, take are going to take longer than build it back. So there's, we're going to have continued spending on those programs. You know, some of these programs are, fund, are running through the expense budget, some are running through the capital budget, the longer term projects, more resemble capital projects, even though it's federal funding. Um, so all the money's been allocated. We've been reimbursed. You know, all of the funding has been described and allocated to a program and published in action plans. This new action plan, once it, once it is approved, will rearrange $50 million of already existing funding. And, you know, I expect that, you know, we'll spend all the money in a compliant fashion on the programs as outlined in the current action plan. So I, I'm just, uh, I'm trying to focus on the solvency of Build It Back right now. Uh, oh, okay, so uh, fine, specifically. So, so specifically for Build It Back, we see the, the program coming in on budget as currently budgeted for with the additional 500 million that was approved by HUD last end of December 2016. Mm -hmm. And and so, uh, because we're obviously last year we we learned through media reports that there was the shifting of these funds. Um, and so obviously there are concerns just about solvency today. Mm -hmm. And so I'm being told that there are no solvency budget issues. Is that correct, Director Peterson? Sure. And so how do you explain to someone that says that there were there are fewer applicants in the pool today, but there were still these cost uh, overruns that forced the city to shift the funds last year? H how do you respond to that? So, um, I mean, I've, I've responded that, to that in detail. Um, the cost to elevate and rebuild these homes and even acquire these homes is greater than was originally estimated the requirements for storm surge have changed since the storm and the understanding of what it would take to elevate or um, build a new um, appendix G flood compliant um, home on the site of an 81 year old beach bungalow and a you know very small lot was not what was originally anticipated and just harping on the questions that Councilman Matteo asked before about the acquisition program, uh, to the best of your knowledge, why wasn't that option advertised at the onset of the program? Okay. So I wasn't here at the onset of the program well, again. Well, when, when you first but, arrived. But yeah. the understanding that it was much more loudly discussed on Staten Island because they had all gone through the buyout process and there was a lot of elected officials who were who were pushing it when people got to the point when they were substantially damaged and they were offered elevation or rebuild they were all offered acquisition homes that are attached to other homes in most cases probably were not so that's a little reason why Coney Island was probably treated a bit differently um, but it is very clear that that was a louder message. Um, and even Staten Island wasn't happy with um, exactly what that looked like. And part of the problem and one of the things that I think we need to be ready for in the next storm is to have an acquisition program ready to go. So it's not, you know, we'll acquire your home two and a half years after the storm or five years after the storm. But, you know, if you are interested in selling your home and you're eligible, you'll be able to sell much more immediately after the storm. Right. Um, and also, well, Coney Island does have its fair share of attached housing, no question about that, but Seagate doesn't, and that's why many folks there do not know about it. Um, I also want to note that the one thing I, and I haven't obviously seen the study yet because it hasn't come out, but I haven't heard anywhere so far the, the, the issues of language access because as you know in my district, we, and I appreciate you've come down a number of times, and I want to credit you for that, but you, you know 
Gray Slow, and you know other homeowners, particularly Asian American ho homeowners in my district that did not know about the program when it first was rolled out. And so how do we deal with that? How will we deal with that? Making sure that language access is taken very serious because a number of folks, it, that the message was just not reached. And has that, was that touched upon in the study that you've seen so far? Um, I haven't seen that specific item. One of the things we are trying to do is also just document all of the outreach events we've done over time. Um, but I think in any recommendations coming out of this recovery effort, um, language access by both the, you know, one of the things that we feel very strongly is um, actually having city recovery staff as we do now. We have really great staff that are trained to do this. Um, and having those staff be bilingual in addition to whatever language services is really important. And we have discussed that issue already. Um, and just a couple of final uh, questions and then we'll turn it over to our uh, next panel. Um, so some homeowners who have become ill, fallen into debt and lost their mortgages while wait awaiting build it back assistance. Uh, we've heard of these cases. And for those homeowners who are experiencing extreme financial hardship, um, would the city consider mortgage assistance programs to help these families? I don't, I don't know the answer to that, but if you can refer anybody in that situation, one, both to the Center for New York City Neighborhoods and then um, to, to our office, we'll look into the specific cases. So you, you, don't have, you, you haven't heard of any cases of people who are still waiting for help that have are going through experiencing possible foreclosure or on the verge of foreclosure? So we've had people since the storm <coughs> who are at risk of foreclosure, and one of the big things, you know, that might have predated Sandy even, um, and so one of the big services that Center for New York City Neighborhoods offers is assistance with forced closure, and um, HPD offers that too. So I'm not an, an expert in that, but we've been offering that since, since the storm, or since our services have been in place. Okay. Um, and just a, go, just a uh, last question I have is with regards to chain of command with Build It Back, and HRO has been some shifting, uh, uh, and I just want to make sure. So. Uh, the, the person that you d report directly to at City Hall is, I saw, obviously I don't know the mayor is For the, the last mayor, two but, years, right. so there there hasn't been shifting, is Alicia Glenn. Alicia Glenn, well, yeah. Deputy Mayor Before Glenn. it was Gold, Bill Goldstein and, was yeah, there. Yeah, and Tony so Schwartz, just if, if you can just give me the chain of command, Alicia Glenn, and then. She reports to the mayor, I report to Alicia Glenn. And, 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 she's, Deputy mayor and Glenn. she meets with you regularly yes. to discuss these yes. items. And so she's aware about, uh, I mean, but with regards to these HUD directives, they've been uh, they've been kept abreast of these. Uh, she they, meets these with meetings? me, and she meets with HUD. She's well aware of all of this. Okay, all right. Um, just wanted just to get clarity on that. Uh, if there are no other questions from my colleagues, I thank the first panel. I'd like to call uh, Buffy from Far Rockaway. We're just going to set the clock for, for three minutes, and then we'll, we'll have some questions uh, afterwards. So uh, you may begin to get, give yourself some extra time. Uh, do I need to be sworn in or anything? Okay. Um, in January, of uh, by the end of 2013, I had my applications in, all of my receipts. By January of 2014, I was called and told to come in for my meeting so they would tell me what they were going to do. Um, two days later, they called and canceled because I'm a landlord. I still live in the house, but I'm a landlord. February, they called me to set up the meeting again. By the end of uh, two days later, they called and canceled because I'm a landlord. March, I didn't hear from them. April, they ca I called them and said, listen, this has happened. Um, what year, just uh, saying March, April? Uh, yeah, by January, they called me to set up our meeting. Build It Back called me to set up our January meeting. January of? January of 2014. Okay, all right. That. I'm all sorry. Right, sure. uh, February of 2014, again, they called and then canceled. March, I didn't hear from anyone. April, I called them, said, listen, this has happened before. Um, and uh, 
sorry I had a seizure. Um, if I go, if I have a really bad seizure, don't call an ambulance. All they can do is charge me. Um, anyway, uh, April, they didn't call me, so I called them, told them the situation. They said there's no reason you can't have a meeting, and um, then they called me two days later and, call, and canceled because I'm a landlord. Um, May, I went ahead and went to see Donovan Richardson. He spoke to them, finally got me a meeting. They told me to bring more um, receipts in, and I was like, why well, I brought in all my receipts? They said, because of the fact that more time has passed, we're sure you've had more uh, expenses and we want to make sure we cover everything. I show up with the receipts uh, in June of 2014. They tell me they can't use any of the receipts because they're not, they're over a year old, they're not a year old, and they were, they were only covering receipts for up to a year after the storm. And of course, the, you, the, I handed everything in in, October, uh, in November, and so they already had everything. Um, then they, t when they, uh, then they told me they want to raise my house, um, but my neighbor, because I'm attached, has to be involved. And by raise, they don't actually mean they're going to raise my house because of the type of house I have. They were just going to add another floor to it. Um, I asked them then for the applications for my neighbors. They told me they weren't ready. I continued asking. They did not get them, my neighbors, the applications until April. I know that for a fact because they never actually received them. I went personally and picked them up from Build It Back and hand delivered them to my neighbor. After almost two years, my neighbors weren't thinking about the stress, the pain of um, going ahead and you know, the stress of the disaster. They were thinking of the disaster of moving their family and having to deal with all of this. Plus, they'd spoken to people who were going through nightwear, nightmares with Build It Back already. So they changed their mind. They decided not to raise. Um, I was, I'd already paid a 400 and something dollar transfer amount. I don't know why I had to pay a transfer amount. They told me because I had spent less than the amount of money that was, um, that I received from my insurance. I told them I had, um, my voice is changing, it's not me, it's my pacemaker. <laughs> I had told them that uh, I had receipts for these expenses and they wouldn't look at them because they weren't old enough. <laughs> Thank you. Um, the, uh, no, I gotta remember where I was. They told me they wouldn't expect them. I didn't go ahead and cause a ruckus about that because I found somebody else to pay my transfer amount. They had me go ahead and pick out paint colors for, my, for raising my house. Um, I had already asked them before they'd even gotten the applications to my neighbors. I asked them when construction would begin. They told me by the end of summer 2015. So since sub 2015, I had been expecting them to call any minute now and say, you need to be out. Then by the middle of 2016, I found out they weren't going to raise after all. Um, I asked them, why can't you just raise my, my side of the house? They finally came down to it's because of the insurance that they couldn't do it without everybody moving out of the entire building. They gave me some ceiling reasons of nothing which really my parents lived in Maine and raised their house, had a not raised, but they had another floor added onto their house. And they lived in the house the entire time they're doing it. They can't tell me everybody needs to move out of the building so they can add another floor. And that Maine is more qualified at making taller buildings than New York City is. That just doesn't work for me. Um, they also, when they, so th I was asked if there was a, a limit of time to go ahead and try to get my neighbors to uh, change their minds. They said that David Lewis told me there was no time limit. Then they go ahead and called me and said there is a time limit and said I absolutely had to, dis to transfer to the, um, I want to say refurbish to the, <laughs> to the restoration. I don't do well with words because of my epilepsy. I think the, the, the moderate rehabilitation. Option. The rehabilitation, exactly. I had to transfer over that. They also told me they were going to, on the, the thing, said I was going to be giving some money as uh, to help me with that. 
Um, recently, I've asked about that money, and Sherelle has told me that it was a typo. You don't discuss typos for weeks before the paperwork actually comes out. <laughs> I was told I'd be getting money. I still expect to be getting money. Actually, I'd still like my house to be raised. And again, by raised, I just mean they're adding another floor. They're, they essentially, they said they were going to move the first floor to the second and the second to the first, which makes no sense to me either. Why don't they move the first floor to the third and leave the second floor alone? Um, so what, what I'm uh, if we could just go right into questions. Yes. What I'm not hearing so far is anything about case management. You're doing this on your own, or do you no. have someone assisting you? This was supposed to be, well, I'm doing this on my, uh, trying to get everything done on my own, but um, uh, David Lewis was the person who was assigned to David me. Lewis works for Build It Back, is that yes, correct? Yes, he works for Build It Back. Do you have a case manager from a nonprofit organization helping no, you I on your not. case? No, I do not. I didn't know there were any. <laughs> you are m one of many would, people I've heard that from, and, yeah. I, and I want the administration to hear that. And I'm not saying, I'm not looking to point fingers as to why that's the case. I'm just telling you that's just what I'm hearing from many people. This, uh, you are going through a lot in your life, oh, and you're this. on your own handling this, and that is, I have a problem with that. You should be given... And, and I'm living off of disability. I right. have a very limited income for New York City. The only reason I'm here is because I need public transportation, and I can't live in a city where buses stop at 8. Okay, so just to kind of summarize and wrap up, you, you applied for the program, right? You mm -hmm. stayed through the program. You went through a whole bunch of meetings, even though if they were canceled, you still showed up. You went through, through the entire process. Where do you stand right now? Right now, supposedly they have already finished the repair work. Now, they were going to put a bump out on the back of my house, which is an elevated shed where they would go ahead and move my so utility you, so, room. So you, you agreed to the I agreed to that. moderate rehabilitation? Because uh, if I didn't, I was going to be kicked out of the program. I had no choice. And, so and if I got kicked out of the program and didn't let Build It Back help me and there was another storm, then the city could refuse to help me in the future. Uh, and their official reason uh, was that you, you could not get an elevation rebuild was because... My neighbors changed their mind. ...did not sign the license yes. agreements. When they got the application uh, more than a year and a half after I first asked for it, they had changed their minds. And actually, they, had, they have told me, and again, this is hearsay because I'm saying it, but they told me they actually went to Build It Back to try to sign in after finding out. Because I went to, when I found out they wanted to elevate my house and they wanted to bring them, I went and told them, and they were thrilled. They asked to bring me with them. Well, th this was another issue that I, I raised with Build It Back at the time mm -hmm. when they were looking to enforce a strict deadline last year that I knew would push people out. Um, I'm aware, because I have a lot of attached houses, houses in my district, mm -hmm. and Build It Back did have a, a number of meetings. I want to say that for the record. A number of meetings were held to discuss some of the challenges. But the one thing that I did note is that these are legal papers that you and your neighbor are being asked to sign to discuss yes. liability. Because if they have to do work on your house, they might need access to that person's house because it's attached. Yes. These are legal documents that cover liability. We're dealing with folks who are not lawyers. <laughs> We're dealing with folks who are nervous. They're, they're nervous about signing anything with the government. They, in my opinion, were not given adequate legal counsel, adequate legal advice. I'm not saying from Build It Back. Build It Back staff, most of them, uh, that came, means are not lawyers to my knowledge, but, some, but, but an attorney from a credible organization to meet with them and go over the paperwork, no cost, of, no cost to you or to your neighbor, and say, this is what this, this, is what this paper is about, no one is hurting you. We're looking to protect you. I've heard from a number of people that they were just not sure what they were asked to sign. There are cases of people who are just just not decisive, and that's and mm -hmm. I can't fault build it back for people who just can't make a decision. But there were a number of people that I've seen spoken, with, particularly immigrants as well, that were just not sure what they were being asked to sign. Well, and, and, and that and, and that's and that's something that I correct me if I'm wrong. Was your neighbor or you provided counsel? about what this paperwork was about? I was given an opportunity to step across the hall to where the lawyer was um, after the fact. You were? Yes. But was your neighbor? I, as far as I know, my neighbor was not given any information. They told me they decided not to do it because they couldn't afford it. 
and they had already <coughs> taken out, they didn't have flood insurance, so they had um, gone ahead and taken out a loan. And so they were paying the loan back, and then on top of that, uh, they were thinking that they were going to have to rent an apartment and then rent an apartment for their tenants and all kinds of other things. And I kept trying to get them to show them, listen, this program will help you here, this will pro program will help you here. And because I kept, tr I kept trying to help them to give them information, they actually threatened to sue me for harassment. <laughs> and all I was doing was trying to let them know about different programs. I feel that if they had had, it, well, first of all, if they'd gotten the paperwork at a decent time, and they had been offered legal counsel that perhaps they wouldn't have been scared off of it so easily. Right. I mean, I, I want to be clear. I'm not faulting Build It Back for having to ask people to sign these documents because yeah. these are legal documents. It covers liability. It's not their fault. Where I am going to question the city is that did they provide adequate counsel to people to know what, what they're being asked to sign? Anyone that comes to your door saying, sign this piece of paper, you have to be suspect about. <laughs> you Let have to be suspect you. of that. Look, politicians <laughs> knock on doors asking for votes. People are afraid to open the door sometimes. I'm sure my colleagues kn know that feeling. And imagine going to someone and saying, sign this piece of paper. That's, it's, 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 it's a, it's a nerve-wracking thing. And so the one thing that I, I did stress to city officials is that we need to make sure that we're providing adequate counsel and information in settings that are comfortable for people. And I think that in, in your particular case, uh, this, this has been frustrating. But I'd like to speak to you offline uh, after this hearing so we could just, uh, if, if my colleagues don't have any questions or, or any other issues, I think this is the only panel that we, we have. Uh, okay, because I'll speak to you offline. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you. And this hearing is adjourned.